Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs It was in the middle of winter, and the snowflakes were falling like feathers from the sky. And a queen sat at her window working at her embroidery frame, and it was made of ebony. As she worked, gazing at times out on the snow, she pricked her finger, and there fell from it three drops of blood on the snow. And when she saw how bright and red it looked, she said to herself, Oh, that I had a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood of this embroidery frame. Not long after, she had a daughter, with a skin as white as snow, lips as red as blood, and hair as black as ebony. And she was named Snow White. However, the poor queen died when the child was born. After a year had gone by, the king took another wife, a beautiful woman, but very proud and overbearing, and she could not bear to be surpassed in beauty by anyone. She had a magic looking glass, and she used to stand before it and look into it and say, Looking glass upon the wall, who is fairest of us all? and the looking glass would return. You are fairest of them all. And she was contented, for she knew that the looking glass spoke the truth. Now Snow White was growing prettier and prettier every day, and when she was seven years old, she was as beautiful as day, far more so than the queen herself. So one day, when the queen went to her mirror and said, Looking glass upon the wall, who is fairest of us all? It answered, Queen, you are most fair, tis true, but Snow White is more fair than you. This gave the queen a great shock, and she became yellow and green with envy. And from that hour, her heart turned against poor Snow White, and she hated the child. Envy and pride, like ill weeds, grew in her heart higher every day, until she had no peace day or night. At last she sent for a huntsman, and said unto him, Take the child out into the woods, so that I may set eyes on her no more. You must put her to death, and bring me her heart for a token. The huntsman consented and led Snow White away. But when he drew his sword to pierce Snow White's innocent heart, she began to weep, and she said to him, Oh, dear huntsman, do not take my life. I will go away into the wild wood and never come home again. And as she was so lovely, the huntsman had pity on her, and said, Away with you then, poor child for he thought the wild animals would be sure to devour her. And it was as if a stone had been rolled away from his heart when he did not put her to death. Just at that moment, a young wild boar came running by, so that the huntsman caught it and killed it, and taking out its heart, he brought it to the queen for a token. Then it was salted and cooked, and the wicked woman ate it up, thinking that it was Snow White's. Now, when the poor child found herself quite alone in the wild wood, she felt full of terror, even of the very leaves on the trees, and she did not know what to do for fright. Then she began to run over the sharp stones and through the thorn bushes, and the wild beasts after her, but they did her no harm. She ran as long as her feet would carry her, and when the evening drew near, she came to a little house, and she went inside to rest. Everything there was very small, but as pretty and clean as possible. There stood the little table ready laid, and covered with a white cloth, and seven little plates, and seven knives and forks, and drinking cups. By the wall stood seven little beds, side by side, covered with clean white quilts. Snow White, being very hungry and thirsty, ate from each plate a little porridge and bread, 
and drank out of each little cup a drop of wine, so as not to finish up one portion alone. After that, she felt so tired that she lay down on one of the beds, but it did not seem to suit her. One was too long, another too short, but at last the seventh was quite right, so she lay down upon it, committed herself to heaven, and fell asleep. When it was quite dark, the masters of the house came home. They were seven dwarfs, whose occupation was to dig underground among the mountains. When they had lighted their seven candles, and it was quite light in the little house, they saw that someone must have been in, as everything was not in the same order in which they left it. The first said, Who has been sitting in my little chair? The second said, Who has been eating from my little plate? The third, Who has been taking my little loaf? The fourth, Who has been tasting my porridge? The fifth, Who has been using my little fork? Then the sixth, Who has been cutting with my little knife? Then the seventh said, Who has been drinking from my little cup? Then the first one, looking round, saw a hollow in his bed, and cried, Who has been lying on my bed? And then the others came running and cried, Someone, Someone has, has been, been in our bed too. too. But when the seventh looked at his bed, he saw little Snow White lying there asleep. Then he told the others who came running up, crying out in their astonishment, and holding up their seven little candles to throw light upon Snow White. Oh, goodness! Oh, gracious! What beautiful child is this? Ah! And were so full of joy to see her, that they did not want to wake her, but let her sleep on. And the seventh dwarf slept with his comrades, an hour at a time with each, until the night had passed. When it was morning, and Snow White awoke, and saw the seven dwarves, she was very frightened. But they seemed quite friendly, and asked her what her name was, and she told them. And then they asked how she came to be in their house. And then she related to them how her stepmother had wished her to be put to death, and how the huntsman had spared her life, and then how she had run the whole day long, until at last she found their little house. Then the dwarf said, If you will keep our house for us, and cook, and wash, and make the beds, and sew, and knit, and keep everything tidy and clean, you may stay with us, and you shall lack nothing. With all my heart, said Snow White. And so she stayed and kept the house in good order. In the morning the dwarves went to the mountain to dig for gold. In the evening they came home, and their supper had been ready for them. All the day long the maiden was left alone, and the good little dwarfs warned her by saying, Beware of your stepmother. She will soon know you are here. Let no one enter the house. Now the queen, having eaten Snow White's heart, or as she supposed, felt quite sure now that she was the first and fairest, and so she went to her mirror and said, Looking glass upon the wall, who is fairest of us all? And then the glass answered, Queen, thou art of beauty rare, but Snow White living in the glen with the seven little men is a thousand times more fair. Then she was very angry, for the glass always spoke the truth, and she knew then that the huntsman must have deceived her and that Snow White must still be living. And she thought and thought how she could manage to make an end of her, for as long as she was not the fairest in the land, envy left her no rest. At last she thought of a plan. She painted her face and dressed herself like an old peddler woman, so that no one would have known her. In this disguise she went across the seven mountains, until she came to the house of the seven little dwarfs. 
and she knocked at the door. But fine wares to sell. Fine wares to sell. Snow White peeped out of the window and cried, "Good day, good woman. What have you to sell?" Good wares, fine wares, laces of all colors. She held up a piece that was woven from variegated silk. I need not be afraid of letting in this good woman. So Snow White unlocked the door and bought the pretty lace. What a fine figure you are, child! Come and let me lace you properly for once. Snow White, suspecting nothing, stood up before her and let her lace her with the new lace. But the old woman laced so quickly and tightly that it took Snow White's breath away, and she fell down as dead. Now you have done with being the fairest. Not long after that, towards evening, the seven dwarfs came home. And were terrified to see their dear Snow White lying on the ground without life oh or motion. Oh my! Oh goodness! They raised her up, and when they saw how tightly she was laced, they cut the lace in two. Then, when she began to draw breath, and little by little she returned to life. When the dwarves heard what had happened, they said, "The old peddler woman." was no other than the wicked queen. You must beware of letting anyone in when we are not here. Then when the wicked woman got home, she went to her looking-glass and said, Looking-glass against the wall, who is fairest of us all? And it answered her as before, Queen, thou art of beauty rare, but Snow White, living in the glen with the seven little men, is a thousand times more fair. When she heard that, she was so struck with surprise that all the blood left her heart, for she knew that Snow White must still be living. But now, I will think of something that will be the end of her. And by witchcraft she made a poisoned comb. Then she dressed herself up to look like another different sort of old woman. So she went across the seven mountains and came to the house of the seven dwarves and knocked at the door and cried, Good wares to sell, good wares to sell. Snow White looked out and said, Please go away, I must not let anybody in. But you are not forbidden to look said the old woman, taking out the poisoned comb and holding it up. It pleased the poor child so much that she was tempted to open the door. And when the bargain was made, the old woman said, Now for once your hair shall be properly combed. Poor Snow White, thinking no harm, let the old woman do as she would. But no sooner was the comb put in her hair then the poison began to work, and the poor girl fell down senseless. Now, you paragon of beauty, this is the end of you. By good luck, it was now near evening, and the seven little dwarves came home. When they saw Snow White lying on the ground as dead, they thought directly that it was the stepmother's doing, and looked about found the poisoned comb, and no sooner had they drawn it out of her hair than Snow White became herself, and related all that had passed. Then they warned her once more to be on her guard, and never again to let anyone in at the door. When the queen went home, she stood before her looking-glass and said, Looking-glass against the wall, who is fairest of us all? And the looking-glass answered as before, Queen, thou art of beauty rare, but Snow White living in the glen with the seven little men is a thousand times more fair. When she heard the looking-glass speak thus, she trembled and shook with anger. 
Snow White shall die, though it should cost me my own life. And then she went away to a secret lonely chamber, where no one was likely to come, and there she made a poisonous apple. It was beautiful to look upon, being white with red cheeks, so that anyone who should see it must long for it, but whoever ate even a little bit of it must die. When the apple was ready, she painted her face and clothed herself like a peasant woman, and went across the seven mountains to where the seven dwarfs lived. When she had knocked on the door, Snow White put her head out of the window and said, oh, I dare not let anybody in. The seven dwarfs told me not to. Oh, all right. I, I can easily get rid of my apples elsewhere. Here, I will give you one. <gasps> no, I dare not take anything. Are you afraid of poison? Look, here. I will cut the apple in two pieces. You shall have the red side, I will have the white one. For the apple was so cunningly made that all the poison was in the rosy half of it. Snow White longed for the beautiful apple, and as she saw the peasant woman eating a piece of it, she could no longer refrain, but stretched out her hand and took the poison half. But no sooner had she taken a morsel of it into her mouth and she fell down to the earth as dead. And then the queen, casting on her terrible glance, laughed aloud and cried, <laughs> As white as snow, as red as blood, as black as ebony, this time the dwarfs will not be able to bring you back to life again. And she went home and asked her looking glass, Looking glass against the wall, who is fairest of us all? And at last it answered, you are the fairest now of all. Then her envious heart had peace, as much as an envious heart can have. The dwarves, when they came home in the evening, found Snow White lying on the ground, and there came no breath out of her mouth, and she was dead. They lifted her up, sought if anything poisonous was to be found, cut her laces, combed her hair, washed her with water and wine, but all was to no avail. The poor child was dead and remained dead. Then they laid her on a bier and sat all seven of them round it and wept and lamented three whole days. And then they would have buried her, but that she looked still as if she were living with her beautiful blooming cheeks. So they said, we cannot hide her away in the black ground. And they made a coffin of clear glass, so as to be looked into from all sides. And they laid her in it, and wrote in golden letters upon it her name, and that she was a king's daughter. Then they set the coffin out upon the mountain, and one of them always remained by it to watch. And the birds came too, and mourned for Snow White. First an owl, then a raven, and lastly, a dove. Now for a long while, Snow White lay in the coffin, and never changed, but looked as if she were asleep, for she was still as white as snow, as red as blood, and her hair was as black as ebony. It happened, however, that one day a king's son rode through the wood, and up to the dwarf's house, which was near it. He saw on the mountain the coffin, and beautiful Snow White within it, and he read what was written in golden letters upon it. Then he said to the dwarves, Let me have the coffin, and I will give you whatever you like to ask for it. But the dwarves told him that they could not part with it for all the gold in the world. But he said, I beseech you to give it to me, for I cannot live without looking upon Snow White. If you consent, I will bring you great honor, and care for you as if you were my brethren. When he so spoke, 
the good little dwarfs had pity upon him and gave him the coffin. And the king's son called his servants and bid them carry it away on their shoulders. Now it happened that as they were going along, they stumbled over a bush, and with the shaking the bit of poison apple flew out of her throat. It was not long before she opened her eyes, threw up the cover of the coffin, and sat up alive and well. Oh dear, where am I? The king's son answered, full of joy, You are near me. In relating all that had happened, he said, I would rather have you than anything in the world. Come with me to my father's castle, and you shall be my bride. And Snow White was kind and went with him, and their wedding was held with great pomp and splendor. But Snow White's wicked stepmother was also bidden to the feast, and when she had dressed herself in beautiful clothes, she went to her looking-glass and said, Looking-glass upon the wall, who is fairest of us all? Then the looking-glass answered, O oh, queen, although you are of beauty rare, the young bride is a thousand times more fair. Then she rallied and cursed and was beside herself with disappointment and anger. First she thought she would not go to the wedding, but then she felt she should have no peace until she went and saw the bride. And when she saw her face, she knew it for Snow White could not stir from the place for anger and terror. For they had ready red-hot iron shoes in which she had to dance until she fell down dead. The End The Queen Bee Two king's sons who sought adventures fell into a wild, reckless way of living and gave up all thoughts of going home again. Their third and youngest brother who was called Whitling, and had remained behind, started off to seek them. When at last he found them, they jeered at his simplicity in thinking that he could make his way in the world, while they, who were so much more clever than he, were unsuccessful. But they all went on together until they came to an anthill, which the two eldest brothers wished to stir up that they might see the little ants hurry about in their fright and carrying off their eggs. But Whitling said, uh, Leave the little creatures alone. I will not suffer them to be disturbed. And they went on further until they came to a lake where a number of ducks were swimming about. The two eldest brothers wanted to catch a couple and cook them. But Whitling would not allow it and said, Leave the creatures alone. I will not suffer them to be killed. And then they came to a bee's nest in a tree, and there was so much honey in it that it overflowed and ran down the trunk. The two eldest brothers then wanted to make a fire beneath the tree, that the bees might be stifled by the smoke, and then they could get at the honey. But Whitling prevented them, saying, Leave the little creatures alone. I will not suffer them to be stifled. At last the three brothers came to a castle, where there were in the stables many horses standing, all of stone. And the brothers went through all the rooms until they came to a door. The door was at the end secured by three logs, and in the middle of the door a small opening through which they could look into a room. They saw in the room a little gray-haired man sitting at a table. They called out to him once, then twice, but he did not hear. Then they called out a third time. He got up, undid the locks, and came out. Without speaking a word, he led them to a table, loaded with all sorts of good things. And when they had eaten and drank, he showed each to his own bedchamber. The next morning, the little gray man came to the eldest brother, and beckoning him, brought him to a stone tablet, on which were written three things, directing by what means the castle could be delivered from its enchantment. 
the first thing was that in the wood under the moss lay the pearls belonging to the princess, a thousand in number, and they were to be sought for and collected, and if he who should undertake the task had not finished it by sunset, if but one pearl were missing, he should be turned to stone. So the eldest brother went out and searched all day, but at the end of it he had only found a hundred pearls. So just as was said on the tablet, came to pass, and he was turned to stone. The second brother undertook the adventure the very next day, but it fared with him no better than with the first. Although he had found two hundred pearls, he was also turned to stone. So at last it was Whitling's turn, and he began to search in the moss. But it was a very tedious business to find the pearls, and he grew so out of heart that he sat down on the stone and began to weep. As he was sitting there, up came the Ant King with five thousand ants, whose lives had been spared through Whitling's pity. It was not long before the little insects had collected all the pearls and put them in a heap. Now the second thing ordered by the tablet of stone was to get the key of the princess's sleeping chamber from the bottom of the lake. Now when Whitling came to the lake, the ducks whose lives he had saved came swimming and dived below and brought up the key from the bottom. The third thing that had to be done was the most difficult, and that was to choose out of the youngest and loveliest of the three princesses as they lay sleeping. All bore a perfect resemblance each to the other, and only differed in this, that before they went to sleep, each one had eaten a different kind of sweet, the eldest a piece of sugar, the second a little syrup, and the third a spoonful of honey. Now the queen bee, of those bees that Whitling had protected from the fire, came at this moment, and trying the lips of all three, settled on those of the one that had eaten the honey. And so it was that the king's son knew which one to choose. Then the spell was broken from the castle, and everyone awoken from their stony sleep, and took his right form again. Whitling married the youngest and loveliest princess, and became king after her father's death. His two brothers were married to the other two sisters and they all lived very happily to the end of their days. The End The Old Grandfather's Corner Once upon a time there was a very old man who lived with his son and daughter-in-law. His eyes were dim, his knees totted under him when he walked, and he was very deaf. As he sat at table, his hand shook so that he would often spill the soup over the tablecloth or on his clothes, and sometimes he could not even keep it in his mouth when it got there. His son and daughter were very much annoyed to see his conduct at the table, that at last they placed a chair for him in a corner behind a screen, and gave him his meals there in an earthenware basin quite away from the rest of the family. He would often look sorrowfully at the table, with tears in his eyes, but he did not complain. One day, while he was thinking sadly of the past, the earthenware basin, which he could scarcely hold in his trembling hands, fell to the ground and was broken. The young wife scolded him well for being so careless, but he did not reply, only sighed deeply. Then she bought him a wooden bowl for a penny, and gave him his meals in that. Some days afterward, his son and daughter-in-law saw their little boy, who was about four years old, sitting on the ground and trying to fasten together some pieces of wood. What are you making, my boy? asked his father. I am making a little bowl for Papa and Mama to eat their food in when I grow up, he replied. 
The husband and wife looked at each other without even speaking for some minutes. At last they began to shed tears, and went and brought their old father back to the table. And from that day he always took his meals with them, and was never again treated unkindly. The end.